Oh God, I pray in Jesus name, would you please minister um, to her Bob's situation with her internet? Would you help her Lord? Um, I, I know that um, Aruba is also having problems with her internet. I pray that you would help her as well. Zishan's having problems with this internet today. I pray you would help him as well, Lord. And um, I ask God, would you minister to our students? They really need help in getting all of their classes done. And I pray that you would intervene. Um, I pray that you'd help them, Lord, to be able to do what they need to do. Um, I pray that you will richly bless in every way our students. I commit this class to you, Lord, and all that we discuss in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Rabab, you need to know this. We are going to just go ahead and have class like normal. So on Friday, we're having class. And you okay. don't have to come. This is what's going to happen. The students, I was going to do the Eid holiday, but the students didn't want to do that. And so we're going to just go through, and the course will be finished in two weeks. Um, okay, sir. But if you can't do it, if you want to celebrate Eid for some reason, that's fine. You, you can finish it on June 12th, but we're going to finish it early. And that way I can be on the beach without having to worry about class. That sounds like a good deal. Okay, okay let's start. I have a PowerPoint today um, because this is one of those introductory lectures. And it looks to me like I didn't run it. So let me, let me run my PowerPoint. Take one minute. Anybody have any questions about the course or anything at all? Anything? Questions? When are we expected to write our final exam? Ah, uh, yeah. So um, this is a great question. And I've been wondering that too. Um, my goal was that I wasn't going to have any classes this weekend and until Thursday. And so I was like, I was like, oh, well, this is going to be good. I won't, I'll be able to figure out the, the exam, but I'm going to have to figure out the exam anyway. So let me, let me figure it out. I don't know if I'll get to it today, but by Friday, I should know for certain what your final exam is going to be because I haven't figured that out yet. So once I figured out what the final exam is gonna be, then I'll figure out what I'm gonna do, uh, when it's gonna finish. So I sh you can pray that I'll get it done by Friday. Sir, okay, uh, sir. So there's no assignment, right? No assignment. No paper, no nothing. Just love and happiness. And a tough exam. It's going to have to be a tough um, final quiz. It's going to have to be pretty tough. All right, here we go. Oh, wait a minute. I'm, I'm supposed to do this. I just wanted to see the water's moving. Okay, that's it. It has nothing to do with the course at all. Zero. It's just water coming over a waterfall. You know, where I used to live, we had a waterfall as beautiful as this one. Oh, no, not quite as beautiful, but almost as beautiful as this one. I think this is from, this looks like Yosemite National Park in California, I've been there. All right, let's get to work. Wisdom literature. This includes Job, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs. I don't really see Song of Songs as wisdom literature, really. I think it's something else, but they include it. I don't, I don't really include it. Okay, when we talk about wisdom literature, the, the book of Job, book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, are all considered wisdom literature. We have one other book that is hard kind of to fit. It's Lamentations. And Lamentations isn't wisdom literature. It's mourning, sadness, over the destruction of Jerusalem. So, but we're not going to look at Lamentations. All right. Job, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs. Solomon is involved in three of these four books. Many of the sayings in Proverbs come directly from Psalms, but not all of them as you're gonna to see today. Um, the Proverbs of Solomon, Psalms one, as Proverbs 1.1 1, 1 says, Proverbs 10.1 says, Solomon's Proverbs, and then it begins a bunch of Proverbs that are directly from Solomon. 
So Solomon probably started the book of Proverbs. In other words, what I'm think, what I think, and I don't, we don't know, but Solomon probably started the book of, Sol of, of Proverbs. He probably said, I'm going to gather my wisdom and all the wisdom of the other wise people together into a book. And probably, probably he's the one that did this. Um, yes, I'm going to talk about this here. Solomon is, a, is, a, is an interesting character because as you know, God gave him an, an incredible wisdom, but Solomon left the Lord and worshiped false gods. And that's pretty strange. Solomon, um, the Deuteronomy said that the king, the year that he became king was to copy by hand all of the Torah, all five books of the Torah. So the Deuteronomy said that the king the first year he became king was supposed to copy the whole thing. And then every year he was supposed to read through the whole thing. And every day he was supposed to read some of it and think about it. And yet Solomon disobeyed God right from the start of his rule as king. I mean, right from the start. Um, and I don't get it. I don't, I don't get Solomon at all. So we have a lot of wisdom from Solomon, but Solomon wrote better than he lived. He didn't follow his own advice. And so Solomon is an interesting person because what he wrote is the word of God, but how he lived, he was an idolatry, worshiped idols. Not, not a man of God at all. Not even slightly a man of God. And so he's a very confusing person to me. Any questions so far? Don't name your kid Solomon. These two are Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied. Here's an interesting thing. From Proverbs 25 through to the chapter, I think it's 29, um, they are Proverbs that come from Solomon, but Hezekiah, who was a king quite a long time after Solomon. Hezekiah is the one that actually had his, um, his scholars copy these. And the word copy here, this word copy is a special word. It doesn't just mean we copied it from another book. It means they took all of the sayings from Solomon everywhere that they found and they copied, it, it actually means to move to, and they moved that into one book. So there were apparently lots of different books that had Here's a Solomon, here, here's a proverb from Solomon. And so what the men of so Hezekiah did for chapter 25, you notice here it's in chapter 25, this starts of Proverbs. It's the men of Hezekiah collected Solomon's Proverbs into a collection, and that's a part of the book of Proverbs. So the book of Proverbs isn't just Solomon. It's Solomon, and then... Proverbs that were collected by Solomon, that Solomon didn't make himself, but collected by Solomon, other wise people said. And then there's the ones that Hezekiah's men did. And then we have two chapters that are written by completely different people. So Proverbs is a collection which was collected during the time of Solomon and then after the time of Solomon. Here, look at this in chapter 30, the words of Agur, son of Jake, the oracle, the man's oration to Ithiel, to Ithiel and Ukal. Who is Agur? Nobody knows. No one's ever heard of this guy before, except that we have a whole chapter of Proverbs that is written by someone completely different. Not Solomon, no one we know about. It's good stuff, but we don't know who this person is. And then we have another chapter. The words of King Lemuel, an oracle that his mother taught him. Who is King Lemuel? No clue. Nobody knows who this person is, but it's in Proverbs. So you should have some questions about this. Does anybody have any questions about this? So it means that uh, proverb is something that is uh, just a collection of uh, words, different stories, different mm -hmm. verses. Yes, just like the Psalms are. The Psalms are also collections. Um, 
And I completely believe that the Holy Spirit was in charge of the collection process. I believe all the Proverbs are the word of God. All of the Proverbs are the word of God. All of the Psalms are the word of God. I have no question at all about that. Zero question. They were collected over a long period of time. The Psalms were collected over a long period of time. And at least the Proverbs were collected long enough that, I mean, you know, we've got Hezekiah. Hezekiah, I guess Hezekiah was about, about, seven, about 730 B.C. He's around the 730 B.C. time. Um, and Hezekiah is 250 years after Solomon died. So at least over a period of 250 years, it was collected, and maybe more. I think that Agur and Lemuel are very ancient people. I think that they were living in the time of Solomon. That's my personal opinion, but I don't know that. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Okay, Solomon tells us the purpose of the book. For learning what wisdom and discipline are, and for understanding, this is, this is Proverbs chapter 1, starting in verse 2. So right away, Solomon, Solomon gives us an introduction. That's why I think, I think that Solomon started the collection. I'm like really pretty confident that Solomon started the collection. Because the verse 1, it says that it's the Proverbs of Solomon. But we know that these are these Agur and Lemuel. We know that those people wrote part of it. Um, so anyway, for learning and what wisdom and discipline are, and for understanding and insightful sayings, for receiving wise instruction in righteousness, justice, and integrity, for teaching shrewdness to the inexperienced, knowledge and discretion to a young man, a wise man will listen and increase his learning, a discerning man will gain guidance, obtain guidance, for understanding a proverb or a parable, the words of the wise and the riddles. That's the purpose of the book of Proverbs. And I want you to notice I've got these colors for a reason. Um, this is called a chiasm. A chiasm is where you've got something that has a center, which is right here, and then it kind of goes out, learning what wisdom and discipline are, and for understanding insightful statements, this line matches this line. For understanding a proverb or a parable, the words of the wise and the riddles. These are the same kind of thing talking about something written. For receiving wise instruction in righteousness, justice, and integrity is the same thing as a wise man will listen and increase his learning, and a discerning man will obtain justice. This is about what you do. And then the middle one, for teaching shrewdness to the inexperienced, knowledge and discretion to the young man, that's by itself. The third one, the green, that's the main point. The main point is that the book of Proverbs is for teaching shrewdness to the inexperienced, knowledge and discretion to a young man. <coughs> That's the main point. And the way that happens is through learning wisdom, through understanding a proverb, it's for receiving wise instruction, um, listening and increasing in learning. That's how it happens. But the purpose of the book of Proverbs is the green. In chiasms, very, very common in Hebrew, very common in the Old Testament. It's this kind of a deal. There's the outside, the middle, or the inside, and the middle. Outside are these two, the inside are these two, and the middle is this. The middle is always the main point. We have chiasms in the New Testament too. Some, not too many, but we do have them for sure. But chiasms, all over the Old Testament, all over the Old Testament chiasms. And why do I want to know? It's because this is the real purpose of Proverbs, the green, to teach shrewdness to the inexperienced, knowledge and discretion to young men. How do I do that? Through learning what wisdom and discipline are, understanding insightful sayings, for understanding a proverb or a parable, that's how I learn, and then receiving instruction that means it goes deeper and then listening and increasing and learning and then finally shrewdness. Now, purpose of the first part of Proverbs to teach shrewdness to a young man. Shrewdness means having insight into how to deal with people. 
I think I'm probably wrong because my Urdu is horrendous, but I think the word days, days has this idea. It means sharp. And the person who is days, so much dar is different. So, so much dar is wisdom, isn't that right? But someone who is days is someone who's sharp, who knows how to deal with other people, knows how to make good decisions, knows how to deal in the market, how to, to bargain well. That's what Proverbs is for, is to make young men and women sharp so that they know how to deal with life. Any questions about this so far? No, sir. Okay. Masood, any questions? No, sir. Okay, we move on. Okay, for receiving wise instruction in righteousness, justice, and integrity. The word righteousness in Proverbs means being in a right relationship with God and with other people. Uh, it only occurs, I don't know, like nine or 10 times in Proverbs, righteousness. But when you read it, righteousness is having a right relationship with God. Righteousness is having a right relationship with other people. And that's really what Proverbs does. Proverbs teaches you how to have a right relationship with God. And it especially teaches you how to have a right relationship with other people. That's really what Proverbs is about. Because the purpose of Proverbs is to teach shrewdness to the inexperienced, knowledge and discretion to a young man. And shrewdness means to be sharp. Most, if not all, of Proverbs are very different from the law or the prophets or the Psalms. So this is a danger. A danger is that godly, good Christians can take the Proverbs and act as if the Proverbs are the law or the prophets or the teachings of Jesus. They're not. The Proverbs are different from that. They're really completely different from the law. So the Old Testament Torah describes, and you've heard this a million times, how the Hebrews can stay in the land and receive God's blessings. That's the purpose of the Torah, is how do we stay in the land? How do we receive God's blessings? Well, one way is the king, when he becomes king, copies all of the Torah, word for word, he copies it, and then he reads it, and he studies it every day. That's, that's, what the, that's what's supposed to happen, one of the things, and which Solomon didn't do, apparently. But the Torah says, how can you stay in the land? The prophets call the Hebrews to return to obedience. So whereas the Torah says, how do you stay in the land and receive God's blessing? The prophets call the Hebrews to return to obedience to the Torah, or God will punish the nation with a curse. So when you read the prophets, they're trying to bring the people back to the law because they don't want Israel to be taken out of the land. That's the last thing the prophets want. So the Torah is about how to receive God's blessings in the land. The prophets call them to return to obedience. But the Proverbs, they're not dealing with that at all. They're dealing with how do you live practically in any age or place? So when you read the Proverbs, it's how do you live anywhere in the world? How do you live in a practical way so that you know how to live with other people and you know how to live with God? It's not talking about the covenant. It's not talking about how do we stay in the land? It doesn't have any warnings about how to stay in the land. It doesn't talk about those things. It, the word covenant appears like, I guess, one time in the whole book of Proverbs. I, I think that's right. Uh, the, the covenant is not important in Proverbs. Why? Because covenant, because covenant is about the Torah. The prophets are very concerned about covenant. Oh, my gosh. They're very concerned about covenant. But the Proverbs aren't, because the Proverbs are not about how to stay in the land. The Proverbs are about how do I live with other people? And how do I become successful? And how do I figure out how to have a good life with God? And so the Proverbs are very different from law, very different from Proverbs. Any questions so far? This is why I don't do PowerPoints, because PowerPoints just, they're like, kind of like a, a truck. It's going really fast and it just pushes you out of the way. And none of the students ever ask questions when I do these PowerPoints. It's like, this isn't any fun. All right, we move on. Uh, the Proverbs are God's will. The New Testament writers 
quote from the Proverbs in some really, really, really important passages. One of my very favorite passages in the Bible. And you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. And then here is a quote from Proverbs. My son, do not take the Lord's discipline lightly or faint when you are reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he punishes every son he receives. That is a quote directly from Proverbs chapter three. Do not despise, despise the Lord's instruction, my son, and do not loathe his discipline. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, just as a father, the son he delights in. So the author of Hebrews is quoting from Proverbs because the author of Hebrews knows that the book of Proverbs is God's word. We don't have a super whole lot of quotes. We do have definite law of quotes there. Um, we don't have a super whole lot. Uh, however, the Proverbs are not laws to obey. They're advice on how to be smart in a fallen world. They are not promises or predictions, but they are probables. So biblical wisdom is more than knowledge. Wisdom is not only about what we understand. Wisdom is about how we live. So biblical wisdom is, has a different focus altogether. The prophets and the law are trying to figure out how to stay in the land as God's people under God's covenant. That's what the law and the prophets are trying to do. They're trying to stay in the land where God's blessing is. But the Proverbs, this biblical wisdom in general, is about how do I live in this world regardless of the covenant? What's, what's a practical way that I'm going to be able to be successful? And, and you really need to think of the Proverbs. A lot of the Proverbs are something that anybody in any culture in any place in the world can do, knowing Jesus or not knowing Jesus. This is not about being a Jew. Proverbs are not about being a Jew. Proverbs are about being a human being. So biblical wisdom explores how to live well in God's world, talks about God a lot, totally does, but you can be an atheist and do the book of Proverbs and profit from it. You can, because it's good, practical wisdom. Obviously, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I mean, that's, that's Proverbs chapter one, verse, I think it's six or seven. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So if you don't fear the Lord, it, there's a lot you're gonna miss out on from Proverbs, but there's so much good advice in general in Proverbs. So it's not about the covenant. It's not about staying in the land. It's not about God's warnings for the future. It's none of that stuff. It's about how do I live in a good relationship with my neighbors and a good relationship with my boss and a good relationship with the king and in a good relationship with God. Um, it's not the same as law, which gives God's command or prophecy, which calls people to repent and follow God's ways or tells about the future. It's not that. Wisdom is insights by God's people through the generations that helps them understand how to live as a people who dwell in God's presence. So when I look at wisdom, when I look at wisdom, it's, it's not about the land. It's about relationships. That's what it's all about. Questions? Sir, how come, how come Solomon made relationships with other gods and other people and forgot about his own god, even when he had Torah and all? Like, yeah, that's wasn't he guilty of all this? Say it again? Wasn't he guilty of all this? Yeah, like yeah. he wasn't oh, yeah, he his own heaven. Paul says that no idolater will enter the kingdom of God. No idolater. Solomon is not in heaven. He's in hell. We're, we're not, we're not going to see Solomon. We're going to meet a lot of people named Solomon. <laughs> Suleiman, no. But a lot of Suleiman's in heaven, but no Solomon. Yeah, he didn't make it. He didn't make it. And I'm, I'm, because, because he was an idolater. A super, pretty, really bad idolater. Well, the reason is because of his wives. That's what, that's what Kings tells us. Kings chapter, 1 Kings chapter 11 says that because his wives led him away. And I mean, after all, he had 700 wives. I mean, my gosh, come on, people. 
700 wives and he had 300 concubines, which are like sort of like wives, but sort of like not. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. I just can't even wrap my mind around that. And the Bible forbids that. Okay, so this is what happened. Very early in his reign, very early in his reign, he married Pharaoh's daughter. Because that's like an alliance between Israel and Egypt. So very early on, he married Pharaoh's daughter. Ah, uh, so this is like, yeah, it's like 500 years, a little bit less than that, 500 years after, after Moses had led them out of the promised land and Moses had said, God said, I will never let you go back to Egypt and you must not buy horses from Egypt and you must not marry women from Egypt. And Solomon did buy horses from Egypt and he did marry women from Egypt. And it was his wives. He built temples and shrines for his wives to worship their gods. And then sooner or later, that seduced him into doing it himself. So I really think he was, I think he was bad from the start, in my opinion. Because he married the, the, the daughter of Pharaoh. Yes, sure. So, oh, sir, uh, like continue what Martina said that Solomon was quite worldly. So, his book that he's written, Proverbs, no doubt that it is the word of God. But I think, as you said, that uh, we can all write Proverbs, that it's a collection of knowledge and wisdom things, you know. And we can write a book of Proverbs, not in a godly wisdom, but other ways. I think it's because uh, I'm just trying to say that uh, why we can write it, because Solomon was in the world, secular world. So that's why an atheist can write on it and anyone can write. Okay, now I didn't say that, uh, that an atheist can write the Proverbs. I said an atheist can obey the Proverbs, can apply the Proverbs, can follow them. So I don't, I don't know if an atheist could do that or not, but I will say that you're right. In this sense, you're right. It's the word of God, and therefore it's without error. Okay, bus, it's without error. It's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. So it's the word of God without error, absolutely. It is much more worldly wisdom, but it's still the word of God. It's all true, it's all real, but it's much more worldly wisdom than you see in the prophets or, or than you see in the, um, in the Torah. The Torah is about how do you please God and love God and love your neighbor. But Proverbs are about how do you become successful? Yeah, see, so Proverbs is a lot different. Um, I believe that God anointed Solomon to write the Proverbs and I thank God for the Proverbs. I love the Proverbs. I think that God anointed him to do it, but I think even as he was doing it, he was already falling into deep sin. Now, he didn't start working at until he was old. Yes, go ahead, Shagun. Okay, sir, I got my answer. Okay, Martina? Uh, sir, I'm wondering that there's a lot of text about uh, not getting involved with prostitutes and the women who are not your wives and something like that. Like there's a lot of text in Proverbs about it. How come he not understand it by himself? I think that Solomon thought he was better than it. Let me tell you what I think. It's just my opinion, I can't prove it, but I think I'm right. Prob I think what happened to Solomon, Masood, you gotta watch out for this. You be very careful in your life. What happened to Solomon is he was so stinking smart and he had so much knowledge and he understood so many things and understood God so well in so many ways that he thought that he didn't have to obey and he still would be fine. And the reason I said the thing to Masood is because if Masood follows this M. Phil and he becomes one of the very few people who has a graduate degree in biblical, in biblical studies in Pakistan, it's very easy for a Christian who has a higher education in theology to start thinking that they're better than other people. That's what happens. And I had a student say to me, a student in our MPhil program came to me last year and he, he said, sir, I am, not last year, but in January, he said, I'm really worried about this MPhil program because I'm starting to look down on other Christians in Pakistan. I'm looking down on pastors when I hear their sermons. I think, oh, I know better than you. That's what happened to Solomon. He thought, I can do it because I am so better 
so much better than everybody else. I understand so much more. And he became proud in his heart. And I think that's how he felt. I, I can just tell you, you know, the same thing is true with people that, that do miracles. You got a guy, you got a guy that's like a miracle working person. Why right, does all these miracles, okay? Um, today, I'm talking about today. And he's, you know, he's got a church and everybody comes to his church, he's doing miracles. And he is clearly disobeying God in, in, in very clear ways in other parts of his life. Can even be sexual. But all different parts of his life, he's disobeying God, clearly. But the reason why he doesn't deal with it is because he's doing miracles. And he thinks he's anointed by God. And he thinks he's like special. And because he's still being anointed by God, he's still doing miracles. He's like, oh, well, it's okay. It's all right. God doesn't mind what I'm doing because look how God's using me. And so I think that's the deal with Solomon. Solomon was so stinking smart. He was so in, in brilliant that he thought that since God was blessing with brilliance, he didn't have to obey God's law. I'm pretty sure that's what it was. But you won't be able to ask him. Yes, go ahead. When uh, prayers get answered, some people also think that they are so beloved uh, children of God that they will be always forgiven. Oh, yeah. I, I, I'm telling you, the worst thing that happens to me is when I have a good week and I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm good with God. And I'm telling you, as soon as you do that, let him who thinks he stands be careful lest he fall. The person who thinks he stands, that's the person who's going to fall. That's how that works. Poor Solomon. Okay, the book of Proverbs is divided into Sir? seven. Yes. Sir, when, uh, I have a question. When uh, God uh, appointed Sol Solomon and before uh, uh, God appeared in his dream, he disobeyed and he married Pharaoh's daughter. Mm -hmm. So after that, uh, God appeared him and uh, uh, the first he did uh, wrong so why did God appear in his dream and bless him and give him riches and honors I don't know make to promise with him? I don't know I've often wondered that question I'm like what is that all about I I, I can't figure it out um, let me give you an example um, Asa was a good king, okay? He, he's a good king. Asa didn't take away the high places. So that means that there were people in Jerusalem who were going, there was, there was a tower that people would climb up in this tower and they would make sacrifices to Asherah, the queen of heaven, and they would worship Baal and they would do it right in Jerusalem, right in Jerusalem. Now they didn't do it in the temple, but they did it in Jerusalem. And Asa didn't tear that down, but God blessed Asa. So Solomon started off, he didn't worship idols in the beginning. It was when he was older that he worshiped idols, but I don't understand why God didn't discipline him from the start. I, I don't understand that. But I will say this, Solomon built the temple. And a part of the wisdom that God gave Solomon was wisdom to build that temple. I read something last night in an article in prep for today, and this person wrote that, don't think that Solomon's wisdom was really so that he could impress the Queen of Sheba, he could you know, decide between the two, the two women and the baby. Don't think that's why Solomon was wise. The reason that Solomon was wise was so that he could build God's temple. And God wanted, Solomon to be the one that built it because Solomon was the one who was wise enough to do that. So that is an interesting perspective. I don't know if it's true or not. I don't know if he's right when he says that, but it may be that he was wise to build the temple. But I can't. And also, uh, yeah, I understood. And also, sir, uh, when God appeared in his dream, uh, God, maybe in my perspective, God. Um, uh, God disciplining him and uh, like when he in verse 14 he says if you keep my commandment as your father yes. so I will lengthen your day yes. so a little bit of warning or as well as instruction yeah I'm really glad you said that it's really clear when God gives him the wisdom that God's warning him that he has to be obedient to God 
That's a really good point. And so it's not like a surprise or anything. And boy, he had every opportunity. He had a wonderful father. He had every opportunity. But it was pride. Man, pride's really deadly. There are um, different sections in Proverbs. Um, chapter one talks about father advice, a beautiful chapter. It's a wonderful, wonderful chapter, chapter one of Proverbs. Chapter two through nine, it's about this woman. It's Lady Wisdom, she's called. And she's calling out to people to repent. And um, she's calling out to people to, to, to embrace wisdom. It's really, really cool chapters um, of the, the second section. The third section is um, chapters 10 through 29, which are hundreds of Proverbs, applying God's wisdom, fear of the Lord to every situation. And these are, these are Proverbs by Solomon, but not just by Solomon. He also collected some of these. It's, it'll say, um, the wise also say, it says something like that. And then, as I told you, there's a section of wisdom poems by Agur, whoever he is. And then finally, uh, wisdom from King Lemuel. That's a really, really, both of those. Section four and section five are very good. <coughs> very, very good to apply. Let me get some water here. Oh, out of water. Okay, Proverbs is about probabilities. Okay, so when you look at Proverbs, think of Proverbs as possibilities um, or probabilities. So if you do what Proverbs says, the probabilities are that things will go as the proverb says they will go. In other words, what the Proverbs say is true, but life always doesn't always happen that way, okay? So to say, if you live a certain way, then this will happen, usually but not always. All right, let me show you an example of that. The fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. Now, it just makes it as a statement. Please listen to this, everybody. You must hear what I'm saying, okay? This is really important. So the Proverbs say, the fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. It doesn't say the fear of the Lord Often the fear of the Lord prolongs life. Nor does it say the fear of the Lord prolongs life, but sometimes good people die young. It doesn't say that. It says the fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. But actually, in real life, that's not necessarily true. For example, Josiah, one of the very best kings, his life was much shorter than King Manasseh, who was the worst king. Manasseh reigned as king for 55 years. He was the longest reign of any Hebrew king was 55 years. That's Manasseh. But Manasseh, David only reigned for 40 years. Solomon only reigned for 40 years. Manasseh reigns for 55 years. And he's the worst king. All right, my point is, the fear of the Lord prolongs life, but not always. Sometimes it doesn't. But generally speaking, it does. I mean, if you think about it, it's really true. Fear of the Lord means that you're going to drive carefully. Fear of the Lord means you're not going to get drunk. Fear of the Lord means you're not going to go around smoking and, and ruining your lungs. Fear of the Lord means you're going to show courtesy to people. Fear of the Lord means that you're going to work hard at your job. All those things are a part of the fear of the Lord. So if you're doing all those things, the chances are pretty good you're going to live longer. But not necessarily. There are people who don't live long, like Stephen. I mean, the, the, the Stephen who was, who was stoned to death, he had the fear of the Lord, but he died. So does that mean he didn't have the fear of the Lord? No, it means that the Proverbs are not formulas that guarantee success. They're not promises, they're not formulas that guarantee success. They're just a general rule. It's really saying, as a general rule, the fear of the Lord prolongs life, but it's not a promise. You got that, right? Does everybody understand that? This is so important with Proverbs and wonderful, godly, wise Christians will quote the Proverbs as if they are a promise when they're not a promise. They are a probability. Probably, if you fear the Lord, you're going to live longer, but not always. Promise, the Proverbs are not promises or formulas that guarantee success. And the book of Job and the book of Ecclesiastes show us that there are exceptions to what the Proverbs teach, and that's okay. 
even in the book of Proverbs, even in the book of Proverbs. Uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I just say this. There are two large collections. I already said that. I don't need to do that. Let me give you an example of these prob uh, probabilities. That's a fool, by the way. This, this guy here is a fool, just in case you're wondering what that is. Don't answer a fool according to his foolishness, or you'll be like him yourself. That's Proverbs 26, verse 4. Here's Proverbs 26, verse 5. Answer a fool according to his foolishness, or he'll become wise in his own eyes. Like, wait a minute. Wait, time out. That's what that means. In America, if you do this, it means time out. Time out. Don't answer a fool according to his foolishness, verse 4, verse 5. Answer a fool according to his foolishness. Which one? What's the will of God? Should I not answer a fool or should I answer a fool? How do I know? See? And so that's because Proverbs is not, it's not, it, it, this doesn't happen in the Torah. You'll never see this kind of a thing in the Torah where it says, do this, don't do this. Saying the same thing. It doesn't do that in the Torah. It doesn't do it in the New Testament. It does it here because Proverbs is not about, this is how God's blessing is on you. This is how you're going to stay in the land. This is, this is how God's going to bring you. That's not what it is. Book of Proverbs is probabilities. Probably, if you don't answer a fool according to his foolishness, you'll be better off. Because if you do, probably you'll become like him. But also, probably, if you answer a fool according to his foolishness, you better answer him or else he'll become wise in his own eyes. So the answer to this is, sometimes it's good not to answer a fool. Sometimes it's not good. Let me give you an example of that. A student who was an intermediate student here, oh word, he was always causing trouble. I think he's mentally ill. And he would come to my office and he would argue and argue and argue about things. He caused problems in, in the chapel. He was very upset because um, we had girls reading scripture in chapel, just reading it. And he got really upset about that. I mean, so much that he would like send around SMSs to everybody in chapel saying, oh, this is really, I mean, I'm serious. It was like sent to like 300 people. I don't know how he did it. But he sent to all these people saying, this is really evil and the chapel is not of God and stuff. And so he would come to my office and argue and argue and argue. And finally I said, we're done. You're not coming to my office anymore. This is just way too much. Then he didn't come back his second year, I think. He might have come back a second year intermediate, but I don't remember that. I don't think he did. And then he started SMSing me like 15 times a day. Now, here's the deal. When I would talk to this student, he would start arguing with me. He wouldn't listen, he would just argue. And I realized this verse, verse four, is exactly how I needed to deal with him because I became an idiot because I would argue with him and we would go on and on and on. I became a fool because I was wasting my time arguing with this guy that wasn't listening. In his case, no answer. But what about if a fool says something foolish, which all of us are fools, everybody. You know that, right? We're all fools. I mean, compared to Jesus, we're all fools. So say, say somebody believes something foolish and they make a statement and you know that if you tell them well, you know, there's, there's something else you need to look at. Look at what this says. And by doing that, that they'll be better off. If you don't tell them, well, you know, this is what this says. But you don't tell them that. Then they might actually think that they're right. And they'll believe something which could actually harm them and other people. So verse 5 says, answer a fool according to his wisdom, his foolishness. In other words, say, well, you know, there's something else you need to know about. And by doing that, you're protecting him from actually thinking he knows something that he doesn't actually know. So sometimes it's good not to answer. Other times it's good to answer. That's the book of Proverbs. It's not the will of God to answer. It's not the will of God not to answer. But it's practically a good idea sometimes. It's practically a bad idea other times. Does that make sense? You see what's going on with Proverbs? That's the way Proverbs is supposed to work. The whole book of Proverbs is like this. Questions? You, you know this when you read the Proverbs. You'll, you'll, you'll see this. 
So it's really tempting to take a proverb and to say, this is the will of God. And, and yeah, in, in a sense, yeah. Um, there are a lot of things that in the proverbs that are like, um, like a soft, a gentle answer turns away wrath. Boy, that's really good advice. A gentle answer turns away anger. The word wrath means anger. So if you know that proverb, a gentle, anger, a gentle answer turns away anger. In other words, when somebody's angry at you, you give them a gentle answer back, and that often heals the problem. If you know that proverb, you should do it. That's a really good proverb. And you're not going to go to hell if you don't do that. But I think it's, I think it's God's will for us. I think God's will for us is not to answer um, with a harsh answer. I think we should answer with a gentle answer. See what I'm saying? In other words, it's not like, it's not like the Torah. It's not like the teachings of Jesus in the sense that, you know, this is life or death. But at the same time, it's a really good way to live, live life. And Christians need to listen to the Proverbs and to apply the Proverbs. Like working hard. Proverbs is filled with things about working hard. Well, we should work hard. And Proverbs teaches us how to do that. So, no questions? No, sir. Okay. I hate doing these. I hate doing these things. But I just felt it was the right thing to do this time, to, to do a PowerPoint, because uh, I, I don't mind doing it in class, because, you know, it's different in class, but online. Okay, isn't that a great... It is also good. Like, we have... Uh... PowerPoint, it is also good to sum up the lots of things in yeah. short time. Yeah. And that's the idea. This is an introduction to wisdom literature and to the book of Proverbs. And obviously on Friday, okay, everybody, Rubab, we're having class on Friday. So on Friday, but you don't have to come. If you can't come, I'm just going to do the same thing and put all the lectures online. I'll do all of that. If you don't come to any classes for the, the rest of the two weeks of the semester, because that's all we've got. Um, if you don't come to any more classes, but you do look at them online, same difference. Same, same grade, all the same. Okay, God bless you all. It's so much fun. Um, can't wait to get back together. God bless you all. Take care. God bless you to take care too.